your decisions, your actions, your life. Don't be like Darren. Who knows what you might miss out on? Continuing our series on fruit picking. I don't know about you if you were here last week. Uh, you, you got familiar with the term cherry picking about picking and choosing um, between things and yes and saying yes and no. This week I got busted for cherry picking a couple of my workouts. My brother texted me saying, "How come you only do some of the things I tell you to do, not all the things?" And I'm like, "Shut up!" And uh, and we haven't spoken since. Yeah, but I don't know. But but yeah, I busted my kids picking out the zucchini in their food, um, and so they they've been picking and choosing what's apparently healthy for them. And uh, I've just decided in my house, my two-year-old doesn't dictate what we eat. Uh, it, 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 he doesn't really know what's good for him, so we just tell him um, or mix it into his food and trick him. Yeah, yeah, this is a smart way of parenting. Is trickery, <laughs> bribing, like no, I don't, maybe not, but. But the cherry picking, anyone, anyone here been kind of busted or you call yourself out for going, mm, I, don't, I know it's good for me, but I don't want to do it? No? Yes? No? Right, well, we'll have another crack this week, but um, no, I'm kidding. I'm sure you're all perfect. <laughs> but I, I've been doing a bit of cherry picking and busting myself. Look, last week we looked at a lot of the things that God wants to do in us, to talk about the, the, the fruit of the Spirit, the goodness, kindness, patience, self-control, or apparently that's one, um, all, so, all sorts of things there as well, about God, what God wants to grow in us and the fruit that he wants to produce in us. That uh, What Jesus talks a lot about is another kind of fruit, and it's not just what, what God wants to grow in us, but it's what God wants to grow from us, out from us as well. And actually, it's a quite a major theme throughout, especially the Gospels. Jesus talks about it quite a lot. Now, we're going to look into this a little bit more, because what I've learned is that whatever God has put in me was never supposed to just stay in me. Whatever God's given me is, was never just designed just for me. That's why I, anytime I talk to people who have seen God do something miraculous in their life, I'm always like, now don't shut up about this because God didn't do it just for you. He did it to work through you. Yes, it is to you, but that's not. we, we should never be the end of the process. We should never be the stoppage in what God is doing because anything that he gets in us or works in us or to us is always not just for us. It shouldn't just stop with us. It should keep going from us as well. And so we're looking at this kind of fruit this morning and how we can be people who produce the fruit from us, not just in us, but from us. And probably another step further than that I'd love to go into at some point is, is not just, are we not just producing good fruit, but is it reproducing in other people as well? Uh, that's the difference is, is when, when a tree, like hey, what, what's an easy way to tell if the tree's an apple tree? Apples would be it. I oh, know I'm not a good farmer. I told you this last week. I need your help. It would be apples. But the thing is, the, apples, the apple tree doesn't just grow apples. It grows a lot of potential for a lot more apple trees, doesn't it? You kind of, it needs to produce fruit, so it might produce more things that produce more things. And that's kind of the way God's kingdom works, is not just in giving you something good, but he gives you something good that can spread to other people as well. And so this fruit is kind of important. I think it's a big, big thing. It's a big, as I said, big issue or big topic in Scripture, big topic with Jesus. This is something that affects our lives. It affects our families, our city, our communities. Uh, and it's a big topic in, in, in the conversation of eternity. Because the story we're going to read here in a second is, is Jesus is telling this parable. And a parable is a story to kind of illustrate something. So um, Beck gets frustrated when I tell parables because uh, I might elaborate on some details that she doesn't like. But, but this is a story that Jesus was telling to paint this picture. And this picture is kind of set in Jesus saying, here is what we want you to be doing. And here's also kind of the conversation that you will have with God at one point. Everyone's going to have this conversation with God at some point. And so this is why I think it's such a big deal for us to get our head around it and get this as something that is, is core within us, that this is important for now. It's important for heaven. It's important in God's eyes, and it needs to be important for us. Uh, and so you might know this story. It's, it's found a, a guy named Matthew who followed Jesus around, heard him say it, and wrote this down in his book. It's found in the 25th chapter. It says this, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. Now, other translations have the word, the master went on a long trip. So this is in relation, this guy is God in this picture. This is Jesus. Uh, he called together his servants, which is us, the rest of us, 
and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Not in proportion to his generosity, it was in proportion to their abilities that he gave it to them. Uh, And then he left on their trip. Now, the other words in another translation, if you just look at this, this is a little segue, but in other translations, the bag of silver, they use a word called talent. Now, talent is usually what we like to describe as like a talent show. Like, I can tap dance. That's he gave me five talents. No, <laughs> and that is not one of them if I have got five. But um, the talent is a unit of measurement. And so each bag of gold is, is one, oh, silver, sorry, is one talent. And one talent is about 35 kilograms. Yeah, so this is a decent kind of like, I'm leaving you with something. Like, you, like I've seen this and go, poor guy that got left one. Yeah, he only got left 35 kilograms of silver. He's doing all right. Okay, he's, he's okay in this story. Because I think we read this sometimes and we think what, what God has given to us is probably insignificant. It's only five talents. Yeah, I can tap dance, I can sing, I can, oh yeah, whatever. No, but what God has given is actually significant. And Jesus chose these words to kind of convey the message that regardless of how much you've got, what you've got is incredibly important. What you've got is a big deal. What you've got is needed. It's required. It's actually really quite significant with what you've got. Uh, and so this is kind of where we're going. So let's not have too much pity on the guy with one yet. He's doing okay. The guy with five must be a legend of a servant. Like he must be good at it. And I like that they use the word servant, not banker. Yeah? Because it wasn't them who got to pick what they, what they were given. They just received from the master and then went and used what they were given. They didn't fruit pick. They didn't go, well, that doesn't really line up with my passions, Sorry. Actually, I'd prefer it if you gave me. No, they just kind of got, got given something and go, well, with what you've given me, I'm going to use it now, uh, which I think is awesome. Anyway, continue. Verse 16 says, The servant who received five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver went on to two more. The servant who re- uh, received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them uh, to give an account of how they'd used what they'd been given. This is where Jesus is kind of alluding, this is going to be us one day as well. The servant whom he had entrusted five bags of silver came forward and five, uh, with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise, of course. Uh, well done, my good and faithful servant. That word's important. He was faithful Servant, you have been faithful in handling small amount. Now go and I will give you many more responsibilities. Isn't it funny that like the worth tends to be different based on your perception of it? Yeah. It's like I think of going, okay, 35 kilograms of silver. That's pretty impressive. This guy has had five bags of 35 kilograms of silver. Like that's, that's a fair bit to me. But when the master comes home, it's like you've been good with the small stuff. I'm like, oh. I think that's, that, that's just crazy. And what I love about this is that sometimes the, the bigness of our responsibility and the bigness of what God has given us and that pressure that we put on ourselves, God says, that's fine, do that. It should be taken with a bit of pressure, but trust me, I've got far more for you and there's far more potential in you to handle a lot bigger things than what you're currently stressing out about. Isn't that awesome? I love that God sees far more potential in us than what I'm aware of. He's a bigger believer in me. He's a bigger believer in you than, than you are. And, uh, and often we can be the cap on what God wants to do in our life. Like, I don't think I can handle any more responsibility. Isn't it funny that they weren't rewarded with the, with the trip to Bali? I think that would, if someone doubled my money, I'd be like, here's some money. Go have a nice night out on the town or go on a holiday. Here's a five star, whatever. But no, he said, here's your reward. Far more things to do. <laughs> I just think it's awesome that God would trust us with even more. Anyway, so he continues on. Full of praise, the servant that received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you have given you two bags of silver to invest. I invest two more. The master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling small amounts. I mean, just the guys at the back are probably stressing. I'll slow down. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I know you are a harsh man in harvesting crops that you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. And actually, some guys who do commentaries on this stuff 
um, look at the, if you read the original kind of translation of this, they could, they say this kind of message was alluding to the fact that he never thought the master would come back. He thought that there's a, there's a high chance that he's not coming back. And so I don't need to do anything with it because I'll never have to actually give an account for it. This day would have been a bad day for him. Yeah. <laughs> Going all stuff. Anyway, but the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew I harvested crops that I didn't plant, gathering crops that I didn't cultivate. cultivate. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver to those who use are given. Even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. I said this last week, but if, you, if you're anti-prosperity in, in, in the Bible, you're going to hate heaven. And so just avoid it. <laughs> just because it's, it's just going to suck for you if you're like, oh, God's not into abundance. Well, <laughs> you, you're going to be disappointed in heaven um, because he's not stingy. And a lot of throughout scripture is God is capable and believes more, bigger. There's actually far more in him than what we tap into. And he's not all about prosperity, but man, that is a big part of him. He's not stingy. He's not small or insignificant. Anyway, but from those who do nothing, even what little they do have will be taken away. And they throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeah? <laughs> Best word in the Bible when you take it out of context, because actually it's very terrifying, isn't it? That's why you, it, it's a silent G, but if you say the G, it's funnier. Uh, and, and it takes the edge off what is actually trying to be said there. <laughs> I don't want my teeth gnashed. But let, it's easy to focus right on the third guy there, isn't it? That's where my attention's always been drawn, into the third guy, the one with one talent, the one where there's gnashing and evilness and, and naughty, naughty, naughty. Uh, and that's, that's easy for your attention to go there, but I kind of want to look at something else. The fact that everyone in this story was given something significant. That it wasn't, there was a servant with five, two, one, and a loser that had zero. And that, that would have been easy for us to go, well, I'm the loser, clearly. I've got no talent. I can't even tap dance. I can't do those things. And it's easy for us to go there. But the, I want you to hear this, is that it is quite significant, everything that, that he gave the people. And that's what the story is about us, is that God has given something incredibly significant to everybody. And we can miss it by looking at what, what he's given to others and we start to treat what he's actually given to us isn't significant at all. And it's not that important. Like, oh my God, I can't do what, I can't sing like Lucy. I can't do this. Have you seen Andre? Like just, if Andre asked me to lead a small group, I'd lead a small group. And like the actual things I've heard. But you go, he's so talented. You're like, they're just, they've got so much. God has given them everything. Like, look, they're so handsome. Of course, everything's thrown at them. And like, you, you, it's easy to do this and forget. And it, oh, sorry, in by doing that, we seem to think what God has given us is less significant. But what's important in this story, and if you, if you forget just about anything else, it's really vital that you remember this, is that everything that God gave you is important. Yeah. Everything that he put in you is incredibly significant. There wasn't, he never did moderate, didn't do mediocre. He didn't, like, you didn't sneak up on him when you were born. He didn't wake up one morning and go, oh, stuff me, there's another baby. What do I do with that? <laughs> Um, oh, I suppose I've got some leftovers and some scraps and they can have that in their life. No, you are here on purpose and you are here for a purpose. See, for me, I, I was, I, I'm 12 years after my ne next sibling older than me. And, and so I've grown up knowing that I was not planned. <laughs> and uh, you go, oh no, I'm sure that, no, my parents told me. I was, they go, he was an afterthought. No, their response is he wasn't even a thought. That's how we got into that problem. <laughs> by not thinking. <laughs> Welcome. But the good news is, is that I did not surprise God. He knew it. He's like, Doug's coming. It's going to scare the heck out of Randall and Janie. It's going to be awesome. They think they're old. Like, just wait. But, but no, I didn't sneak up on them. I know that I'm here on purpose. That God goes, Doug is coming. I've got to get him ready. There's something for him to do ahead of time. 2019 is here. It's coming up and there's something that I need them to do. And the same is for you. The same thing for you that you are here on purpose. And it's not just that. Is that the gifts and things that God has given you has a, an assignment attached to it. The fact that you've been given something suggests that there's something to do. And so it's not just you're here on purpose. It's that you are here for a purpose as well. And that's a lot, a lot of what this story is conveying. It's, we go straight to the negative because we're like, how do we avoid that? 
But, but what this story is really leading up to is going, look, there is significance handed to you. It's in your hands. That's where it, everything is determined right now, is what is in your hand? What has God given you? And we can belittle what we have, but the thing is, what you've been given is needed in this world. God doesn't throw some waste. He didn't put something in just to take up space. Or like we, we just kill time, you know? Beck goes shoe shopping, and I'm just killing time. That's interesting when while you're killing time, time is killing you. <laughs> and so we often just go through life just kind of killing time as if this is a trial. Oh, this is my trial run. I get all the kinks out of this week and I'll apply it next week. But we never get this week again. We never get a chance to use what God has given us today ever again. This is it. And we can go through it as a trial or go through it and belittling what we've been given, but what I've been given is of great worth and it has an assignment. It's got a job. It's actually got a purpose for the reason I have it. The other thing I love about this is that there is a reward. There's a prize. Is anyone like winning? Or is it all about having fun? Is that, is that you, the way you were raised? It's, like, it's not about winning. It's about having fun. Your parents never won. That's why they told you that. <laughs> Because if you've won, you know it's all about it. Like winning is good. Uh, but like, again, a, a bit of uh, insight to my upbringing. I was always told someone who came second came up with that saying. <laughs> that's not biblical. That's quote Ronald Cameron. Uh, not me. That's his fault. But, but I love it. Actually, Paul writes in 1 Philippians verse, uh, chapter 3, he says that I, I run the race, I aim towards the goal so I may win the prize. Is that so I might get a reward? And honestly, I think if we had more thought on heaven and what we're going to be rewarded with in heaven, because get this, this is unreal, that heaven is not just the reward. I love this. I think like you'd go, I'd, just, I'd be happy to get there, but God's actually got far more than just entry access, like behind the like VIP tickets. There's actually rewards uh, to go even further and beyond that. I think that's awesome. And he goes, I press on towards the goal so I may win the prize. Is that, I think if we had more, more attention on heaven, we would make a bigger difference here on earth. It tends to be our attention is all here on earth and we, we often miss what heaven has for us, what God has for us. And so what we've been given is significant, it's important, it's got a job attached to it, there's, there's a reason for us being here on purpose and for a purpose. Now you might be thinking, well, what gifts have I been given? I'm not a preacher, I'm not a singer, I'm not that, I don't fill the four slots that are on El Vanto's rostering system, what do I do? It's that we've actually been given far more and the word talent, I think, has ruined this uh, story for a lot of us because we just think it means talent, whereas it was just a measure of something from, from the master. See, you have been given a lot of things. You've been given a lot of time. So much time, you try to kill it. You've been given a lot of time. You've been given, given your words, and we know that our words are quite powerful. They can form and they can change things. And, and if you don't think so, you, you just think about the person you hate right now because offend, like they offended you. Words are pretty powerful. You've been given plenty of resources and ability to earn. You've been given plenty of finance. This story is a story about that. You've been given... Your work, you've been given family for many of you. You're in a place with a lot of significance and a lot of influence. You've got friends, you've got co-workers, you have peers. You've got a lot of things and a lot of opportunity with this influence and the significance that God's given you. That's, then, then we start going into some of the biblical stuff. You've been given spiritual gifts. Every single one of you has. Isn't that cool? We did that last month of that. Everybody has spiritual gifts. And if you feel you don't, the Bible also says you have been given the fullness of God not the partialness of God, the portion of God. You've been given all of it. I love this, is, I love this in Scripture. I, we do it now, but the Bible never did, is when, when someone came to the apostles with the problem, they didn't go, oh, sorry, I don't care about that stuff. That's not my gifting. You'll have to go see Peter about that. He deals with the wild stuff. Right? Like he, he's really good with, with the smelly people. Well, no, sorry, I don't, I, don't do, I, don't, I don't do healing or anything like that. That's not my thing. No, they just go, I've got, I've got the Holy Spirit in me, of course. I've got all of it. You've been given the Holy Spirit. Actually, what a lot of uh, theologians would argue is that this story, the, the, the things that were given, they would say it's probably one of two things. The first is that it was, they were given this a huge amount of wealth in the love of God. 
They were given love and they were expected to multiply it to other people. They were expected to produce even more of it and have that love outflow and actually multiply in the effect that it had. The other thing that they would say, and I tend to lean a little bit more this way, is that this is the gospel, the good news, salvation. They've been given this amazing gift. What is it produced in their life? Because again, nothing that God has given in us or put in us was designed to stay in us. It was all supposed to keep flowing from us. And as I said, all of these things that God gives us is actually reproducible, not just producible. It's something that you can get to influence other people's lives as well. So this isn't a trial run. This isn't practice. In fact, an author I like named Mark Batterson says this, too many people live as if the goal in life is to arrive safely at death. <laughs> oh, what a bummer. So when I read that, I was like, I can't unread that. So I thought I'd just tell you. You can't, you can't unhear it. Now we're all in the same boat. But I don't want to do that. I don't want to fruit pick from God. I, I, this is my chance and this is your chance to use what God has given you for the purpose that God gave you. It's incredibly significant. I hope you grab that. It, what you've got in you is just, it's worth so much. It's so important and it's so necessary for other people. It's so necessary for God's kingdom. Uh, just if we are fruitful. Actually, the word Jesus used here is faithful. When he said the master comes back, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And this is a little glimpse, or this is kind of my prayer for you, that that's the word, those are the words you hear when you stand before God. It's because, again, this story is very much about that moment when you stand before him and he's going to ask you, he's going to, you're going to give an account, how did you use what I gave you? Actually, this whole parable is kind of sandwiched between two two uh, lessons Jesus was teaching about that moment is standing before him. Anyway, the guy with one talent was in our definition of the word faithful, wasn't he? The way that we use the word faithful these days, he was. Because we use the word faithful when it comes to like old, rusty, broken down dogs. Yeah? He's a good faithful boy. Who's a faithful? Who's a good boy? Like, <laughs> That that's, tends to be our definition because it means they don't go anywhere. They're not doing anything wrong. They're always present. They're always high in attendance that they are faithful because they're always there. But when God uses the word faithful, probably in our world, the better word for us to read is fruitful. It's the same with faith. Faith once upon a time when the Bible was written actually meant it was a verb. Faithful is a verb in God's kingdom. It, having faith wasn't just having belief. It wasn't just having understanding or agreement. Faith was actually, what have you done with what you believe? And so when he says, well done, good and faithful, it wasn't well done, good and agreeable. Well done, good and present. Well done, good and didn't run away with my money. It was just well done, good and you did something. Well, you, you did, you acted. There was something that had, you said had some hustle about you. And this is what faith is as well. It's not just agreeing or assenting that, yes, God is real, but it's my, my life has changed because of what I know. And there's been a shift in that. I actually did a bit of study on that, and they say the, the, word, the Latin word that we now use more so is the thing that had changed our philosophy, is that faith is more of a belief and a, a mental thing, but the Bible always talked about faith as a verb is I have faith, take faith, use faith, pray with faith, do these things faithfully. Uh, and the better word, as I said, for us to maybe try to put in here is fruitfulness. And this is where we can get picky sometimes, isn't it? It's going, what do I want to be fruitful with in my life? I've been gifted a lot of things, but I might not want to be fruitful with my time. I'd rather kill it. I don't want to be fruitful with the resources. I just want to squander. I don't want to be fruitful with my influence because like, I'm not... I don't like them that much, to be honest. I, we can be fruit picky here, but at some point we're going, we are going to stand before God. He said, I gave you a lot of things and a lot of opportunity. How did you use that? Because what we've been given is significant. We are here on purpose for a purpose. And I like the idea that I can actually win. There's this kind of train of thought in, in church where I see it most times I talk to people is that they have this kind of tone about them as if they could never do the thing that God's actually asking them to do. I could never reach it. Which I just, it's heartbreaking. Just because it's big. Just because it's a big thing. But, but we can actually do all this. Uh, Paul writes this in Ephesians 2. He writes to his church, who are probably struggling with some of this stuff at the time. 
He says, for we are God's masterpiece, not afterthought. We are his masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good works. And guess what? He planned them a long time ago. I love this thought that he saw 2019 coming and said, there is a need there. I need to get you ready. I need to bring you into the world because there's something coming up that he planned long ago for us to do what? Good works. He didn't plan for us to do bad works, really sucky works, the, the, the dregs. And I, this is, uh, there's another cold Christian train of thoughts of just going, serving God sucks. It's all awful. It's all hard. It's all just the dirty stuff. But that's not what the Bible says. It's not what Jesus kind of painted that picture. He said, there are good things for you to do. He didn't say that there were no works, which is again another train of thought in churches of going, isn't this what the whole Jesus coming and dying for us thing was all about? Isn't there a word grace that kind of means this? That gets me out of that? Is there a loophole around here? No, there's, grace is another word. It, it is an internal, uh, it's an internal work that has an external reflection. That's the definition of grace, the empowerment of Christ in you. Wow. Something that happens inside that is reflected outwardly. Man, I, I love it. Is that he created us for good works, more than just fruit in us, but fruit from us. Really quickly, there's another story. Jesus kind of, a couple of disciples actually witnessed Jesus do this. And I think he did it on purpose, obviously, but, but this wasn't a, a necessarily a lesson. Uh, he did it. It's found in Mark chapter 11. And this, to give you some context, this story of Jesus's life is wedged between his few visits uh, to the temple. So he went to the temple, left pretty upset about what he was seeing. This story happens. He goes back to the temple. He goes all Indiana Jones with a whip and flipping tables and stuff. It's, that's pretty epic. I, just, I love Jesus for that. Uh, and then he comes back and the story continues. Then he goes back to the temple. And this kind of situation, that well, what's about to happen here, is really his response to what he's seeing in the temple. And he's, he's kind of showing an example of it outside, going, this is what I want to do in there, right? So that's where we pick up here. They're just going to the temple and it says in verse 12, the next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs, but there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. This is Mark. Mark is kind of giving some context there for us. So then Jesus said to the tree, may no one eat your fruit again. The disciples heard him say it and were like, oh, damn. Now they went back into the temple, and this is where Jesus started whipping and turning tables because they were doing dodgy stuff in, in, in the house of God. Uh, and when they left, they noticed this same fig tree, and they pointed it out to Jesus because they pointed it out because it had withered up and died. Like it was super fast, something leafy, something that looked alive, had withered up and died. And now this was in, this is interesting stuff, this, is, this was in mid-April. We've got that context because we know what was going on at the time. Uh, and in March, these, produ- uh, these trees produce uh, these green buds. Now, they weren't necessarily figs, but they were these green edible buds that would produce from these trees earlier. Uh, And generally, servants ate them, but no one really liked them, but they were edible and they were what travelers would kind of snack on if they weren't, or or the poor would eat these things. Uh, And once those kind of buds had grown, they would be followed about two to six weeks later, maybe four weeks later, around this time, after those buds, there would be leaf, big green leaves that would be produced from this tree. And so when Jesus sees big leafy trees, that means that there is something, there is fruit on it. But what would happen is if the tree produced fruit and there was nothing there, it would show that there is no more fruit coming from that tree again. That it was, it looked, it had the look, but it wasn't actually doing what it was supposed to do. And so often they would kill it or pull it up or hope for next season it would change Uh, what was going on there. But Jesus was going to and from the temple and seeing in in people essentially the same thing he was seeing in that tree. Is that he's saying, "When when I look at the religious, they might be pious, they have the appearance, they are there, they are faithful in our term of it, but they aren't fruitful. What he saw was a lot of leafy believers that have the appearance, that have the look, that are doing some of the right things. They're doing kind of, they're following the rules that, that, we, that, that they think that they have to follow, but nothing is actually being produced from them that is important. See, a fig tree is great for it to have leaves, but that's not why it was created. That's not why it's there. 
And for us, it's great for us to, to attend and it's great for us to do the right Christian things. But can I say that that is not the full reason why we are here. It is to use the things God gave us for the reason that he gave them to us, to produce fruit. See, the temple, they were, they were doing great worship services and all the right things, but they weren't leading anyone closer to God. They were leafy, but they weren't reproducing any fruit. They didn't use what God had given them very well. They just used it to perform. And now this is important for us, church. Just look up here for a sec. Is that we are here, we are created, and we are called to make a difference, not just an appearance in life. Is that God has given us everything we need to make a genuine difference. And that difference is actually necessary. It's not just, I want to make my mark on the world. No, there is a space in this world right now waiting for that mark. That we're here to make a difference, not just make an appearance in our life. That we've been given something significant to use. And and what is great is that everything that God's called us to do is attainable with Him. That we can grow, that we can produce, we can... can actually have a massive influence on, on so many people's life because there is more in you than, than you'll believe. There is more potential. And man, I just love this, is that, that God sees your potential, the devil sees your potential, and they go about it two very different ways. But I wish that we could get on their page and start to understand a little bit more that what God's got in me is quite significant and it can't stay in me. I can't just keep this to myself. I can't keep it in. I've got to use the things that God has given me for the purpose he gave it. It's important. This world needs it. Others need it. And I want to ask you, church, will you choose to be fruitful people? Not leafy people. It's great to look good and to do some of the right things, but bring it back of going, there is a reason you are here and and I know if, if you believe in Jesus, this is, and even if you don't, this is 100% coming, is that we give an account for this one day before him. I don't want him to say, Doug, man, you were leafy as. You had a little bit of fruit, but you were leafy. I don't want him to look at this church and say, man, I, I want him to see Highlands Church and say, it is just a fruit factory. Man, it is pumping out fruit. It is producing, it is multiplying, it's reproducing fruit. Everyone there, when, when, when people come in, they, they are leaving making fruit. That we don't produce leafy people in this place. That's my heart, because I want every single one of you and everybody that you know to hear these words, well done, good and faithful. Well done, good and fruitful. Well done, good and you, you, di- you done good. You used what I gave you. You weren't killing time. You weren't wasting it. You didn't just like use it for yourself. You didn't just give it back to me. And Lord, I, I was really spiritual. He said, yeah, you, you were really good inside, but come on, bring that out. Bring that out. So will you be fruitful people? Not just present and not just attendants but people who use those gifts to make a difference in your life, not just appearance in in life. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you you have given us all something of great value, Lord, something that's so significant, something that's worth so much. Well, sometimes we don't see it as important and we don't see the gifts that we have as significant and we, we compare way too much rather than just looking and being thankful for the fact that my God gave me something, that I've been gifted something that is divine, something heavenly that I might be able to bring a bit more heaven down to earth so I might be able to see more of earth back in heaven. Lord, help us be faithful and fruitful. Help us identify those areas that we are leafy. Lord, which is, that's fine. Nothing wrong with those things. In fact, they're quite good, but it can't stop at that. Because we want to make a difference in this world. I want to use my life well. I can't take all the things that I'm trying to build up in my life with me. I'll just leave it for others. But help me use those resources, use this time, use this life for you. Thank you for gifting something so important. 